Because you are going to do a pan every now and then, aren't you? Oh, yeah, I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, one of the problems with growing up, like Jim, I was going to say, one of the problems with um, like being born and growing up in the church is that there's a lot of things that you take for granted. And you never really sort of need to think about them or worry about them. You just accept them as being you know, there. Um, but in fact, what that, what that means if you do that is that you never come to realise just how amazing the Christian faith is. And in many ways, how unique it is among the faiths of the world. So our topic today is one of those things which you all probably just, um, well, most of you probably had a children's Bible when you were in primary school and then grew up and started reading your Bible and you basically just take the Bible as granted. But where did the Bible come from? How did it get there? How do we know that it's authentic? How do we know that it's something that you can trust? Because we do put a lot of trust in the Bible, don't we? We put so much trust in the Bible that we basically, as Christians, we pattern our whole lives around what the Bible teaches us. So that's what we're going to talk about today. How we can be confident in the Bible, or the reasons for us being confident in the Bible. Um, what I'm going to do today with you is mostly focus on the New Testament. But many of the things we'll say about the New Testament also apply to the Old Testament. And there are a lot of additional things <coughs> that could be said about the Old Testament. But rather than sort of try and squash it into you know, a short period of time, um, we'll just take the New Testament as our example uh, for today. And for those in viewer land who don't know whose phone that is, it's not what. <laughs> this is a alarm. I don't even remember setting it. I didn't want to give you away, now your voice gives it away. <laughs> okay, so, <clears throat> first thing to say about the Bible is this. We are not Protestants. Any Protestants here? <laughs> not that I don't like Protestants, some of my best friends are Protestants, they're very nice people. But, Protestants have this idea called sola scriptura. Anyone want to guess what that means? It's a Latin phrase, yeah. Using only one book of scripture? Yeah, sola like soul, yeah. and scriptura meaning scripture. So they, they have this idea of scripture <coughs> alone, or the Bible alone. So they say that the Christian faith is built on the 66 books of the Bible, and they've left out some of the other books that Orthodox and Catholics use, the Deuteronomical books, and that is it. Everything you need to know is there. There is nothing more that God has revealed or told us or anything like that apart from the Bible. We, being traditional Christians, which is the way things were done in the first 1500 years everywhere in all of Christianity, say no. The Christian faith is a living faith. It's a living tradition. And one of the most important parts of that tradition is the Bible, yes. But it's not just the Bible. And in fact, the Bible itself also tells us that there is much more stuff going on apart from what's written in the Bible. Can you think of any places where the Bible says that? There's a few famous ones. Yeah, in the Gospel of John, where he says, Yeah, yeah. If, if, if we were to write down everything that Jesus said and did, then all the world, the books in the world, would not be enough to contain that. That's right. And anything else? <coughs> St. Paul also, more than once in his letters, he says, You know, these are the things I'm telling you now. But when I come, I have much more that I want to tell you. Okay, where is all that stuff written? Well, it's not written, it's passed on in the tradition of the church. And in fact, the Bible itself 
is only the Bible because of the tradition of the church, if you think about it. Because the other thing that we are not is Muslims. Muslims here. Muslims say that the Qur'an, their holy book, was dictated to Muhammad the Prophet by the Archangel Gabriel, I think. Yeah. I could be wrong there. And basically, that's, all, that's what it is. It, it came down from heaven, you know, and he just, well, I don't think he wrote, so I think he said the things and other people wrote down what he said. And, you know, the whole Qur'an basically was there within a few years. You know, the whole thing was given over a period of a few years. And it just came directly from God. The Christian Bible isn't like that. It was actually written over a period of 1,500 years from the time of Moses until the revelation of St. John is about 1,500 years. It was written by about 40 different people. <coughs> it was not just God speaking and someone listening and writing down what God said. Um, it was inspired by God, inspired by the Holy Spirit. But you see in the different writings of the Bible, the different personalities of the people actually coming through in a way that you don't see in something like the Quran. So, you know, the books of Solomon are written in a particular style. The book of Job is written in a more, you know, in a different style, a sort of poetic, really ancient style. People think it may actually be the oldest book in the Bible, like the first one written. Um, even in the New Testament, you see each of the Gospel writers puts in his own perspective. What are the things he's interested in? The Jewish apostles wrote about things that thought would interest Jewish people. St. Luke, being a Gentile, wrote about things that he thought Gentiles would be interested in. St. Paul's character really comes through in his um, letters. Okay, you, you can build up a really good like, per picture of his personality just by reading his letters. But if we're to an atheist, if we're going to be like, um, you know, the book of the Bible was sort of influenced by God, so don't be like, whoever wrote it, whatever God said to them or whatever they saw, is open to their personal interpretation. So it's not legitimate. Yeah. Like, if I'm going to write something because if not even told me something, I wrote it down. <coughs> Let's say that you and Monica both play music really well. Okay, but you're really good at the piano and you're really good at the violin. And let's say we give you the same piece of music to listen to and to work, and now you've got to play that music. Are they going to sound different on the piano and the violin? Of course they're going to sound different, aren't they? But won't you still be able to recognize the tune in both? So you can think of it that way. Each, each of the authors in the Bible, in fact, each of us up until today, is a different musical instrument. And we're given the same tune, which is the truth of God. But we play it in our own way. In all of us, you can recognize the same tune. The notes are the same notes. But we sound different. Now, yeah, um, what the, your question also kind of reflects an idea which is very popular. Uh, okay, it only became possible to ask that kind of question in modern times when we kind of develop the scientific <coughs> method and um, accurate historical methods and literary criticism and those sorts of things. Um, for most of the history of humanity, that question, if you'd ask that question, say, what do you mean? I don't understand what you mean. Of course, it'll be the same truth. Um, sometimes we think that the Bible is going to be mathematically accurate. Accurate with mathematical accuracy about things. Okay, so, and that's, you know, people make the mistake, for example, of trying to get science out of the Bible or mathematics out of the Bible or something like that. But that's not what it's like and that's not what it's meant to do. Uh, the Bible is meant to tell us truths that are beyond this world, not truths that are of this world. And they are very consistent, those truths, and we'll look at some of them, a couple of them, as we go through today. It's very clear that they are consistently given. Uh, and as I said, because we're not Protestants, we're not going to say to people, the Bible is all there is, and we're going to put all our eggs in one basket. We're going to say, no, we know that the Bible is true because it agrees with tradition. 
It agrees with the 2,000 year old tradition passed from generation to generation. And all the records that we have of that tradition, again, some of which we'll be looking at a little bit later today. The Bible agrees with our life today. Okay? Even if everything I tell you today turned out to be wrong, you would still be able to read the Bible and see the truth of what it's teaching. When it says, love your enemies, that's something that's very counterintuitive. It goes against your normal common sense. And yet when people practice it, it actually works. A person who takes what the Bible says and lives according to it actually lives a happier, more peaceful, more effective, more meaningful, more purposeful life. Feels like they're living a life as life was meant to be lived. So it's not just one, you know, we don't put all our eggs in one basket. We actually have many different reasons for saying that what the Bible says is true. Okay. And of course that is very important because um, not only are we asking the question today, is the Bible like historically reliable or authentic? But we're also asking the question, is the Bible something that's worth me basing my life on? Together with you know the tradition that it develops it and so on. Okay. So that's basically what we're asking today. All right, so let's look at some of the things that people say about the Bible to kind of try and discredit it. So one of the things that was very popular in the um, 19th century was theories that the Bible was actually written many, many years after the events that it describes. Okay, like I said, we're focusing on the New Testament. So uh, Jesus lived probably up until about 30 AD. Nobody's quite sure of the dates. Of different reasons. Um, and people were saying that the Gospels were probably not written until the second century and maybe even the third century, like 100, 200 years later. So that would be like today, writing, you know, nobody's written anything about the First World War, and suddenly today we decide, oh, we should write something about the First World War. Oh gosh, is there anyone still alive who was there? No, they're all gone. Oh dear. Oh, well, maybe their children are still alive. Okay, yeah, they're elderly people in nursing homes. Let's go to the nursing homes, find the children of the world, First World War veterans, and see what they can tell us about the war. If we did that, we'd probably get a reasonable picture, but it would still be a little bit dodgy, wouldn't it? Uh, in fact, here is when the New Testament actually was written. Because as more and more research was done, as more and more ancient uh, manuscripts were discovered. And as more and more detail was corroborated with other history, like just normal history that we know, and that, um, the dates of the writing of the, of the books started to come back down, 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 down. So, how long do you think was the period between Jesus dying <coughs> and the very first writing of one of the books? Anyone want to have this? It's not really fair, is it, to be asking this? It happens. Yeah, yeah, so we know St. Mark died in 68, I think we say, but he was martyred. So let's say some six, in the 60s AD, that would be 30 years later. That would be pretty good, wouldn't it? 30 years ago, 1984. And he was an eyewitness, that's true. Okay. What was happening in 1984? Most of you weren't born, were you? But there's a lot of people, well, there's at least three people I see in here who were alive then. And we certainly remember <coughs> in 1984, I was in second year uni. I could tell you what subjects I studied even back then. Yes, but yes, thank goodness it didn't come, to, come through. <laughs> okay, that would be pretty good. In fact, the first or the earliest book in the New Testament earliest one written was the letter of St. Paul to the Galatians. And guess when that was written? It was written probably around 45 AD. So that's now probably 15 years roughly from the time when Jesus died. 15 years ago was 1999. Now many of you, all of you would have been alive then. In fact you may even have some memories of 1999. 
Your parents certainly remember 1999 pretty well. Okay, that's pretty different to 100 or 200 years difference, isn't it? So if, if people want to say, well, uh, you know, the Bible was just written, you know, much later and then we can't be sure it's accurate. The fact is, and I'll, I'll send a document to you later on um, that has all this information in it, but the letters of St. Paul, most of them were written before 60 AD. So that's within that 13 year period, and as early as 45 AD. Uh, the Gospels, the Gospel of St. Mark is thought to be the oldest one, that was written sometime before 68 AD. They usually put the date as between 60 and 70 AD. Uh, and then the, the other Gospels came along soon after that. Um, and then the latest things that we have from the Bible are uh, probably the letters of St. John. They're thought to be the latest ones, and possibly also the book of Revelation. So the book of Revelation, the dates that are given are somewhere between 68 and 100 AD. The letters of St. John, 90 to 100 AD. So basically, by the year 100, all the books of the New Testament were written. So that's, that's pretty good in terms of being very close to the actual events that they're talking about. Now... Georgette mentioned something else, which is that that was a, a, a um, the letters of uh, the Gospel of Mark was an eyewitness report, and in fact, in a number of points in the Bible, we have this point being emphasised that I'm not just writing about something that I heard about from somebody else, but I'm writing something that I saw, yeah, myself. Um, we do know that some of the things were second-hand reports. So, for example, um, it's thought. Um, that the Gospel of Mark does not record only things that Mark himself saw. Although he was one of the 70 and was following with Jesus. But he was also apparently a relative of St. Peter. And he acted as a kind of a disciple or a secretary to St. Peter. And some of the things in the Gospel of St. Mark are very much personal things that St. Peter would have seen. So it's thought that St. Mark wrote down not only things he saw himself, but things he didn't see himself, but heard from St. Peter and wrote them down. On the other hand, the Gospel of John, uh, St. John actually goes so far as to say, he who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth so that you may believe. So he's basically saying, I saw this myself. So, you know, I'm not making this up, I'm telling you what I actually saw. And in his first letter, the first letter of John, he says something very similar. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. Okay, you can't get much more first person than that. You know, that's very direct. And St. Peter also, in his second letter, says, We did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses <coughs> of his majesty. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Um, okay, so not only were they uh, first person with accounts, but they were writing to people who also had often seen many of the things that they have described. So again, you get verses like this one in Acts chapter 2. Uh, I think that's St. Peter speaking. And he says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, the man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. So he's speaking to people who already have seen things that he's speaking about. In Acts 26, um, when Paul is being tried, um, he says, The king before whom I also speak freely knows these things, for I am convinced that none of these things escapes his attention, since this thing was not done in a corner. There was already knowledge about Jesus going around at the time. And uh, in speaking about the resurrection, St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 says that after that, Jesus, after his resurrection, was seen by over 500 brethren at once, 
I feel the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. So when he's saying, when he's speaking about the resurrection of Jesus, he's not just saying, trust me, you know, this is true. He's saying, don't just trust me. I can give you the names of nearly 500 other people who are still around, and if you don't believe me, go and ask them. So that would be like me saying to you today, um, I can tell you that Pope Shimonda visited our church and consecrated the altars. <coughs> and if you don't believe me, I'll give you the names of uh, Armel Elias and Armel Philippe and, you know, Gunabotros and, I don't know, Gebdes was there, but probably you weren't here. Okay. Gunagabel probably was, but he wasn't a Gunagabel at the time. And, you know, I could give you a list of names. Actually, I could put most of your parents there probably as well. <laughs> and I could say to you, if you don't believe me, go and ask them. Now, who says that? Someone who's making up a fable or making up a story. That would be crazy today to say that. You know, if you were making something up, at least, you know, just stay quiet. You, know? <laughs> you don't have to mention, you know, that other people were there or anything. But if you're going to actually go out on a limb and say, you know, here are another 500 people who saw it, and they're still alive, and I can tell you where they are, you better be able to back that up. Um, so this is another of the reasons why we consider that what's actually written in the New Testament <coughs> is actually accurate information. Okay, another thing um, that is said is that, oh, but Christianity changed over time. Um, the Mormons love to say this. Uh, you know the Mormons. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, who are always immaculately dressed when they come and knock on the door in beautifully ironed black trousers and a white shirt and a shiny new little name tag in their chest. Okay? And one of the things that the Mormons are convinced of is that Christians changed everything and that's why they needed a new church. So they reckon that the things that Christians believe today were only made up like in the fourth century, once you started getting the councils, you know, the Council of Nicaea, the Council of Constantinople. You've done, have you done the councils? Okay. And they say, well, no, in the early days, they didn't believe those things. And then they reinterpret the New Testament according to what they believe and make it mean what they believe. So they say things like, oh, Jesus wasn't really was just a God. And then they go on to expand that into a universe full of gods. And you can become a god if you're good enough. And then the other gods will give you your own planet. But ladies, I'm really sorry to tell you, you don't get your own planets. You get to be the wives of gods on the planet. That's as good as you can do. So you can't have female goddesses on planets. But guys, be good. I don't know. You might get Jupiter or Saturn. You're supposed to get another planet somewhere else in the universe and then you populate it with your um, celestial wives. And, you know, that's how you fill it with a human population, etc., etc. Anyway, that's not our topic. Not our topic. Yes, you all want to go and become Mormons now, don't you? <laughs> okay. But, how do we know that Christians in the early days, in the first centuries, believed what we believe. Okay, here is the thing. Let's leave aside um, the Gospels. Let's go to the earliest writings in the New Testament. And you can basically put together the whole of our creed just from the letters of St. Paul. So, in Colossians, it speaks about Jesus being the image of the invisible God and the firstborn of all creation. And in Philippians 2, it speaks about how he's both man and God. Okay, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. Um, that he was descended from Abraham and David, the, <coughs> woman, um, the words that he spoke at the Last Supper, his command to continue to do the Eucharist, uh, after he's gone, his betrayal and his death, his crucifixion, um, the fact that his crucifixion was due to pressure from the authorities, the Jewish authorities, 
his burial and his rising on the third day, which was witnessed, as we said, by many witnesses, including a group of 500 in one go. And remember we said that these letters were all written before 65 AD, most of them before 60 AD. So what that tells us is, the letters of St. Paul tell us, that before 60 AD, we actually had pretty much our creed is maybe not written as a creed, but everything that's in it is clearly believed by the Christian communities that Paul was serving, which is like all over the world, because he traveled all over the world. Okay, so our faith is, is, is there. Not only that, there's something they call the criterion of embarrassment. Do you know what this means? What is it? So if, if you were like making up a story about you and your group of friends, you probably wouldn't make up stuff that was bad. You'd make up stuff that makes you really good. So historians apply this principle of like, uh, the things that I'm telling you by the way are principles that historians apply generally, like to any kind of a document. So this is one of the things they apply. If someone writes something that's embarrassing about them, it's very likely to be true. They're very unlikely to be because that's just human nature. People don't talk about things that are embarrassing. You know, I'm sorry, people don't make up stuff that's embarrassing and they even you know, try and hide it and so on. Okay, what do we find in the, the Gospels and in the New Testament in, in general? We find a lot of things. We find, for example, um, you know, times when everybody didn't like what Jesus was saying and they left him. When he said, I'm the bread of life, I'm the bread that comes down from heaven. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. And then, St. John doesn't go on to say, and everybody said, oh wow, what a beautiful, mysterious doctrine, we love this man. <coughs> no, he records the embarrassing fact that they questioned the teacher, they questioned the rabbi. They said, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? This doesn't make sense. And then they say, Jesus insisted. And then they say, and most of his followers left him that day. They turned around and they walked away. And that's embarrassing. If you're trying to build up this man as a great leader and a great teacher, the last thing you want to say is, and there was this day when everybody thought he was a fool and turned around and walked away and left him. Can you imagine the Liberal Party putting ads before the next uh, election that say, Lots of people hate Tony Abbott. They think his position on asylum seekers is horrible and cruel and evil and they don't like his budget. But vote for Tony Abbott. Okay, I think someone will get fired pretty quickly in the publicity department if they did that. And yet, that's pretty much what St. John did in, the, in his gospel. That's basically what he's doing. He's showing how lots of people refuse to believe what Jesus was saying. So, again, this is showing us that, you know, uh, if you put embarrassing details, you're probably telling a true story. You're not making up something. You're not making a story up. And there's lots of other embarrassing details. St. Peter betraying Jesus, one of his own disciples being the cause of his death. Um, St. Paul and St. Barnabas arguing over Mark and not being able to resolve their disagreement and splitting off and going in different ways. Okay. These are embarrassing things but they are the sign of authenticity, the sign that this is actual events that really happened. We can also work out whether these are actual events by going back into history or archaeology. So there is a lot of historical detail in the New Testament, and we can actually double check it against details that have happened. So one of the things, for example, that has been said is that there was never such a thing as Romans asking Jewish people to go back to their hometown in order to be counted in a census, as Joseph and Mary had to do to go to Bethlehem because he was from the house of David and so on. But in fact, evidence has been uncovered that under the emperor Augustus Caesar,